Good morning, everyone. So uh, I'll just quickly share a bit about myself. Um, I'm the founder of Alvinology.com. The, the name itself is not very original. It's, it's just a, a name that I just wanted to add my Alvin and something behind, and it, it came to this. That was back in 2007, and uh, it was a personal blog then. And that was how I run it, as a personal blog where I share things that I find interesting and things like that. At that point of time when I started, I think most bloggers and, and around there wasn't really a monetization model that uh, most of us were just doing it more like a hobby and we, we, we did it that way. But things have changed a lot uh, as time progresses and uh, with that, I was able to monetize through my blog and I'll share about some of the things that, that we have done uh, and how I grew it from initially just a one-man blog to a company itself. So now I run a company and I, I still have a day job. So I'll share more about that. And uh, I went on to start another few websites one of it is called Asia 361, which is a luxury content website with contributors from different countries. And uh, the poppingpost.com, which is a cinema website. If uh, For Singaporeans, you will know of Golden Village Cinema, right? It's the biggest cinema operator here. So this site is actually uh, done in partnership with GV Cinema, and we work on uh, movie content. And I started a social media and digital agency. It's called AM Collective. AM used to stand for Alvinology Media, and uh, after that, when we registered as a company, it just rolled up as AM Collective because uh, we want to keep the agency part of the business separate from the sites that we own. And we, we have quite a few clients, like uh, Marks, a lot of retail clients, like Marks & Spencer. Some of the bigger brand will be like JBL, the, the audio brand. We, we, we handle their social media content. If you go to their Facebook, Instagram in Singapore, a lot of this are done by my team. and. Uh, Having said that, I also always have a corporate job. So, so those things are on the side. I work at Singapore Press Holding News Corp, which is the parent company for Wall Street Journal Dow Jones. I was heading their social media for Southeast Asia and Japan, and I was in Tomasic Holding doing social as well. Uh, and I work on the Nanjing Youth Olympic Games back in 2014, where I was the head of the global English content, where I led the, the, the team that was churning out the English content. And now I'm actually working at DBS Bank doing content as well. So that's in a nutshell what I do, and uh, yeah. So I, I, I think when we talk about like content or blogs, there's always that two, two, two layer that you look at it. Uh, for WordPress as well, there's people that do it as an individual, and then there's always the there's also the corporate that do it as a sort of a branding exercise or, or, or content that they want to push out. So I, I, I divided my presentation into this way, starting off with the individual, and then after that I'll move on to the corporate portion. So for individual, uh, how it all started, like I mentioned back in 2007, I started it as an experimental platform. It's just for me to push content that, uh, because I've always been in marketing, online marketing, digital marketing from my first job. And I wanted to see if there are different type of content that I can put on my site and if people, uh, people react well to it. I can't do it on my day job where using you know, like corporate websites to do this kind of thing. It might be a bit difficult because it may not go with the brand value or the brand position. But for my blog, I can write whatever I want and I can test that out. So with that, one of the first posts that I did, if you, can you, if you see the picture there, there's a book there, uh, How to Make Money in a Porn Star. That's the book written by Neil Strauss about this porn star in America called Jenna Jameson, who is like the top porn star in the world. And this book is a, it's a comic book, a graphic novel. So something very interesting happened back then in 2007. When this book was launched in Singapore, they, they actually left the book, uh, because it's a graphic novel, they put it together with other comic books for children in the children's section during a book fair. So I went there and I saw, and all the children were, you know, like the girl you see where I, I, I black out her face. They were very, very happy, you know, reading and learning how to be a porn star and things like that. So it's, it's wrong, morally it's wrong. So I, of course I went to the, 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 the bookseller and told them that you should not be doing this as a big you know, book event. You, this book should not be in this section and it's not even string wrap. And uh, then I thought, think about it, like there's a story angle, I have the pictures. So back then there wasn't you know, like Facebook and Twitter, that's 2007. And I thought maybe I will do a little social experiment. Uh, I want to launch a blog on my own website. Why don't I run a story, which is a story on my site, and then I feed the story to the mainstream media, which is the TV station as well as the as well as the newspaper and so on. And that's what I did. And because the source come from my blog, everything drives traffic back to my site. So when I launched my blog, it was not, you know, a lot of people have to build their audience from zero to maybe the first 50 and so on. It was not, there was an instant hit. It was like a few thousand 
maybe more than that. I think it's like tens of thousands of views just on the first day because of this post. And then I realized you can actually, you know, you can, it's not that hard to create a uh, viral, actually it is hard, but you can create viral content if you plan and if you are very strategic about it. Uh, and that's about content growth hacking. And if you get a little bit more strat strategic about it, it, it actually can work. And uh, that's, that's the attitude that I adopt uh, to eventually grow my site as well. So things got a little bit more serious, uh, I think in about 2013. That's where there's a proliferation of uh, social media channels like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, YouTube, and so on. That, that is for Singapore. Uh, that's where you start to see brands. They start to create their Facebook pages. They start to be on YouTube and this and that. And then it, there's this thing that start to come about, this term called influencers, which I, I find it, I don't know, like it's, it's very weird when you, when you talk about influencers. Like if people call me that, I, I think the only person I can influence is my six-year-old son. It's not. But anyway, the term aside, there's this thing about the influencer scene and things like that, and uh, that's where the monetization comes in, which, which changed the landscape quite a fair bit. Because if you think about people back who started back in 2007 or even earlier, a lot of us were not doing it for money. It's just content that we put online. That's how, how I know some of the people at uh, WordCamp as well, like Lester, who's one of the organizers. He, I don't think he started with the intent you know, to make money from his blog, but uh, things start to change. I think for Singapore, maybe it was around 2013. And then at that point, I realized that, hey, maybe I should try monetizing my blog because I never thought that that was possible. And then I start to take in some uh, sponsor posts and things like that, and, uh, and uh, it works. And I got some good income from it, and in, I migrated from WordPress.org to have full control. Uh, I, I migrated to WordPress.org, so I self-host self -host everything and to have full control of the ad management and other functionalities. And then I expanded to more content site in 2016. Why I did that is because Singapore is a very small market. There are, are there anybody here from, say, Indonesia or the Philippines and so on? So, you know, Indonesia alone is 250 million. Something happened. Indonesia has a population of 250 million. Singapore has just 5 million. And even, even Philippines is 100 million. I think it's about 100 million, yeah. So with a very small audience size, there's not much that we can grow in terms of uh, traffic. The most you can hit is what, five billion people. So on that note, the only thing I can do is just to create more websites. And uh, you know, once you hit a pinnacle, you just create, you clone more and more of the same site. So then in 2015, then that's where I moved to do other sites like Asia361 and then the popping post and so on. And then uh, I started realizing that a lot of people were coming to me, a lot of brands, when they come to me, they ask me about uh, to do content for them, right? So then I realized that probably they also need some help with their social media marketing or their content marketing and so on. So I upsell them an agency model. So initially, I was a one-man show where I did uh, help them to do little campaigns to help them to run uh, ads on other blog with advertorials, other bloggers and things like that. But then uh, I felt that uh, I, I got a partner on board and the both of us felt that maybe we could try to do this full time and to run it. So because I always have a day job, so I left it to her and she managed to grow the team. We have about 10 people now. So the agency manages quite a few accounts and uh, that brings in some revenue as well on the side. And, and then after that in 2016, we decided to experiment with e-commerce. Why we do that is because when you look at how things are, for content business itself, I will, I'll touch more about it uh, later. For, for the publisher model, a lot of the news company are not doing that well globally. Uh, that's, where, that's wearing my other corporate hat where I was in content for a long time. So how do you look at different revenue streams? Because at the end of the day, uh, whatever you do, whether it's e-commerce or publishing and so on, it's about human, right? That's the human behind it, whether you're able to mobilize people to buy things, mobilize people to do certain things like read, the call to action and so on. So if you can marry uh, content together with e-commerce, maybe that's a very strong proposition. And we tried that. Uh, so far, it haven't worked that well, uh, but it's still an experiment and we're just trying to put different things to try and sell and so on. So the, the first few products we sold were mostly uh, travel-related products. We don't have an inventory. We, we, we negotiated with partners, partnership with uh, some of the resellers that they, 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 we keep the inventory at our warehouse, so we only get uh, costed whenever the uh, item is ordered and then we'll send it out from our warehouse. So that's how we run at the moment. And this is the site that I run and uh, we, are, we are syndicated with Yahoo News as well and uh, Singtel News Loop which is the, the biggest telco operator in Singapore. So we, we look at distributing our content beyond just uh, our own platform. 
and some of the brands that we have worked with, all from all the way from the big one to from Coca Cola to even Durex, uh, some they got me to do something about some condom game and and uh, yeah, airlines, a lot of airlines as well. So what works? I find that for if you're, if you're looking at you know like just publishing on WordPress and so as a personal blogger and so I I think as an individual, it helps a lot in terms of visibility. You're always out there. Uh, like for myself, I think I get a lot of opportunities because uh, people recognize me for my blog and things like that. And for my career itself, even I after my first one two job where I have to you know write in my resume and so on. Subsequently, it's all headhunted for the role. And when I go for the interview, most of the time, if they have not heard of me, they will know about uh, my site of knowledge, which helps a lot. And then there's personal branding, which is uh, branding for yourself. If you, if you see yourself, if your blog or your site as extension of your personal self, then that helps a lot. And there's always networking and business leads, which I mentioned because of the inquiry I get uh, with regards to the editorial portion. Sometimes I'm able to upsell them different things uh, like the agency, agency services and other services that we offer. And even the, the e-commerce partnership that I have now, the, the reason why I was able to get in touch with the supplier was because previously I've done some advertorial for them and it worked. The, the advertorial did well, it helped them to sell more of their Cabin Zero bag. And then, they, then I talked to them and they said, why not you just open the store and I give you some of the specs and you can try selling them. And yeah, you complement your other form of business venture. So we're we are, we are trying to do uh, the agency that, that I own, we're trying to do different, different things to see you know, with the audience that we have, are there other models, business model that we can do to, to make money? Because I think the advertising revenue, uh, advertising model is, is not gonna work in the long run. It's not scalable. Uh, if not, the news company will still be growing and they are not. And uh, so we'll try different things. We're even doing training. We, we, in fact, we just done one uh, sort of like a travel agency thing where we tie up with Royal Caribbean and we brought some uh, readers to sign up together with us and go on board the cruise and they pay for the, the, the cruise trip. So we do different experiments to see what works. And if it works, we will just replicate and just, just keep doing it. So I'll move to the other aspect. So how about businesses? Why should businesses create a, a WordPress blog? Fundamentally, I think it's the, the change in media lens, the marketing landscape. In the past, probably things would be easier. In the early days of online marketing, and so you just buy banner ads, right? So you, you, you run your banner ads, they give you the impression and account, and you're happy when they say, oh, I delivered 10 million impression for you, and you don't really track like the conversion rates, the performance. There's no such thing as performance marketing and all this. But it have changed a lot. So when all this comes about, it, it makes you start to question you know, the effectiveness of all this marketing thing. And uh, also there's all the ad blockers that uh, people install on their laptop and so on, and they don't see your ads for, for if you run banners and so on and sponsored posts. Then there's also the fact that, uh, are you all familiar with the earn paid and uh, own media thing that the PR, PR agency knows, use? People know, any of you know this? So, so, so in, in the PR world or marketing world, they divide media into earn, own and paid. Earn being those that uh, you didn't ask, you, you, you pitch the story to a publication, for instance, or a blogger, and they write about it, that's earn media. Own are those that are on your own website or on your own content site or own Facebook. And then paid is the one that you pay money to run on their site. So that's how they divide it. And increasingly, you find that uh, actually the people do trust the own and earn media. It's, it's not a, it doesn't mean that if it's on your own platform, it's not credible. It has changed. I think consumers are much more sophisticated nowadays. They can't tell apart if you are telling them bullshit and if it's uh, something really altruistic. And uh, this is in Singapore. In the past, we rely probably, if you talk about credibility and the eyeball and so on, people believe a lot in the traditional media like your Straits Time and the China News Asia, which are owned by the biggest, uh, two, two, two biggest news company in Singapore, Mediacorp and SPH. Uh, but nowadays you see other sites like Mothership and the Smart Local, Vulcan Post, these are all not, uh, they are pure pub publishers only, they are not traditional media, they are all pure publish, uh, online, online publications and they are, they are moving closer and closer to the, the space of the traditional media and yeah. You guys recognize the, 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 this people, the people in the slide? Anyone know who's the, the one holding the newspaper? Should know, right? Yeah. So that's uh, the the founder of Amazon. He actually bought over the Washington Post, which is a newspaper uh, with a long tradition. And uh, on the top, you see South China Morning Post. Anybody from Hong Kong? 
So it's a publication in Hong Kong, very well uh, established and quite reputable as well. They got bought over by Alibaba as well. So when you look at the, 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 the way things is going, you have tech company buying over, buying over publication. Why is that so? I mean, you, these guys used to be big and then there must be some value that they see as well in publishing. Maybe it's not unlocked at the moment, but I don't know what their intent is, but probably they see that, you know, the, the, the large catchment of captive audience and so on. There's something that can be done when you marry that with e-commerce or, or some other aspect. So that's interesting to me. And then if you look at uh, even TV, Netflix is actually mastering their way into TV as well. So you, you know about the original series that Netflix is creating. And even Apple, they are, they are, they are moving into creating original series as well. And then even uh, SBH in Singapore and MediaCorp. In the past, these two big media company, they are competitors, they don't work together. And now you have them shaking hands and signing an MOU together to say that they will be collaborating, which it really signifies that times are quite bad for the traditional media. So that's where you start to question, is that still, you know, do you have to relook your business model in terms of like uh, getting coverage from the traditional press versus pushing out your own content on your own blog and on your own site? And in Singapore, if you look at uh, this guy here, Lee Hsien Long, he's the Prime Minister of Singapore. So you talk about influencer, I think this, this guy is a real influencer. He's probably the top influencer in Singapore that you can't pay money to get him to post about you. His Facebook actually has 1.1 million followers, which is a lot in Singapore, and it's more than a combined reach of the two main newspapers in Singapore. So when you look at it this way, is he a publisher or a media channel? He, he kind of is, right? I mean, he can push out his own uh, announcement about some policies that he's pushing, and he doesn't need a newspaper anymore. He can actually do it himself. And if you look at Donald Trump, the way he's using uh, Twitter, he's his own media company. He don't, he don't really need you know, the other press, and he, he find that is something that is offensive to him, quite fake news, and, 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 and his supporter will, you know, they will just believe that in a way. So when you think about that, if you, if you are creating as a brand or as a business, if you're setting up a blog or a site, a content site, there's, there's really a lot of upside as for branding, and then as well as you own the narrative, you, you get to say the story that you want to say, like in Donald's, Donald Trump's case, you know, these are all fake news, and they are fake news because he, he says so. And then it's also about populating the online literature. You want to have your content out there when people search for certain things, they can find it. Uh, and you hope to be there, like to be there among uh, the terms that you want. Like for instance, if you're running a hotel, uh, you want to own certain keywords, like you know, best hotel in a certain region and so on. And also again, there's also networking and business leads. Like uh, for my day job at DBS, we have content site as well. Some of the content site, because of the way we publish, some of the pieces that are written by our senior management, they get invitation from uh, conferences. Uh, they, are, they are quite big in scale, or they even have uh, interview requests from the media coming in because they read a piece that uh, we shared on our content site. And it complements other form of content marketing. So like for instance, if you are doing social media, uh, you have a Facebook page and so on, if you have your own site, it's, it's, you can actually direct traffic back to your own uh, blog. And there are case studies. So do you, do you got to everybody? I think everybody should be familiar with Uber and Grab, right? Do you all know that they have a blog? How many of you know that? So both of this company, they have blogs, Uber and Grab. And why are they doing this? The, uh, uh, Grab is actually on a disclosure side. We have done some campaign with Grab uh, on the content front. Why, why they are doing this is because uh, at, at the end of the day, content is still something that uh, it, get, it hook people on. So for Grab and Uber, the reason why they are doing this is that there's two front. One is on the consumer side, which is for us. You want to know, you know, uh, whether it's safe and things like that. Uh, the promos that they have, if they can push it out and we read it, we find it and we engage with the brand better, that's for branding. But on the other aspect, which is more hidden, is it actually helped them in their recruitment of driver. The business can only grow as big uh, with more, with, if they are able to recruit more drivers. So they are actually not that many people that want to be you know, an Uber or Grab driver in Singapore, considering you have a small population, so they have to grab drivers, right? So how do you do that and to make sure it's cost effective? From what I understand, they actually have uh, streams of content that are targeted just for the driver and they, they have some performance marketing that's tracked at the back, where for each content piece that they pushed out, for instance, it could be a piece that's targeted to say, very specific profile, like say a, a divorcee who has a kid and they have to drive the kid to school, Maybe they can make one or two trips every day uh, doing a grab, grab hitch or something like that. They will have content for this kind of people. And then they will have content for retirees who may want to earn a little bit of side income. And from there, they can actually track you know, these people that come in and then after that, they go to a certain sign up page and so on. So by the time they reach the, 
the driver center where they sign up the driver physically, these are very good leads because these people have already read all the content they need to read, read and they know what they are in for and they won't waste time you know, going there asking a lot of questions and in the end they don't sign up. So you have versus you know you have 100 people there who haven't read anything and then by the time they go through the whole process only one person sign up, now you actually have very good leads. Maybe it's just 10 people there but they all sign up. So these are things that you can do with content that I find quite interesting. And even Tomasek, Tomasek is the is a sovereign wealth fund in Singapore. They manage the a very large portfolio of something like 250 billion. So a lot of uh, companies in Singapore are owned by them, like Standard Chart. I think some part of Standard Chart, uh, DBS Bank, Changi Airport, and so on. So they are holding company. Why do they need to have a blog or website. They're they actually running this on Medium. It's, it's primarily for branding. So when you, when you, when you mention Tomasek, it draws a blank, but I think they want to own certain content stream. Like for instance, they have a future of category in their content. They want people to associate them with, being, with, with the values of being a forward-looking company that's doing things for good. And equal prosperity, which is about sustainability and so on. So, so that's for branding. So there are some companies that do it for branding as well. And then there are blog shops. So I wouldn't even call them blog shops now. They are, some of these are very, very big, like Love Bonito in Sing, which, which is a homegrown brand from Singapore. They are a very big uh, retailer brand now. They started as a blog shop. So back in the days when there were, you know, like Life Journal and all this, and people were very pop, a lot of uh, people were just selling their clothes and so on that they curate. And they have changed, and they're actually quite big businesses now. And there's no stopping, you know, like individuals from starting just a blog or Instagram, and you know, you grow into a business. These are some campaign that I've done for brands, but I'll skip them because, yeah, they're just just like sponsored series that brands have done together with uh, us. Uh. Yeah. And just to share a bit, uh, just now I mentioned about creating viral stories and so on, right? So see, these are some of the, a lot of time people think that viral story cannot be done, uh, how do I say, it, it, it can't be manufactured, but in a way it can, just that you have to just keep trying. So just to share, this is how I do it. Um, this is thought process, which I think, which I, 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 I get my team to look into when we churn out any pieces. We look at the content pillar, teams which we, we want to own, or if you're a company, which are the teams you want to own, and then we create the stories. After you create, you take the best and you amplify them, and when you amplify them, you look at the different channels that are available to you, whether it's PR and media, social media, if you have uh, partners that you can work with and so on. And then when you find that the story works, you just keep repeating the process again and again. So virus stories can be manufactured if you keep trying. And, but the key is whether the process is repeatable and uh, you can do it again and again and not being afraid to fail. And that's actually a thought process behind it. So I'll just share, like for myself, whenever I approach a content piece, the first question I always ask is whether the output and the input are equitable. What I mean by that is that if I put in, I don't, I'm in quite time stuff because I have a day job as well, right? And I run an agency and so on. So if I were to write an article, I would think about if I were to spend, say, two hours writing this article, researching and so on, is it going to give me a lot of traffic? If it doesn't, and I feel that it doesn't, I probably won't write it. I would rather invest my time in, say, four pieces of uh, articles that I can write in 30 minutes, but the, the, the return may, may not be so high, but it's like buying 4D or buying lottery, you know? So when you spread your egg over a wider basket, maybe you'll hit lottery. In that sense, so the output must always be equal to input. If not, the output must be very, very low, so that uh, the it's, so it becomes like a, 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 a lottery thing. So how how do I determine that? I will, I, will, I will always consider whether the piece is exclusive, the content that I have. Is if it's not, then how do I make sure that my new story is, ex is unique or exclusive compared to others? And then the audience that you're writing for must be very clear. And uh, a good taste, a good taste test is always to think about the people around you, whether your friends will share the piece that you write. If not, probably it won't go that well. It won't do that well on social media as well. And then who will help you to share and amplify this piece, as well as the resources that you have? This can be limiting uh, if you don't have certain resources. And then um, whether you are a subject expert, if you're not, you probably need help to ask 
other people and interviews and so on, and the risk involved. Sometimes when writing certain stories, for instance, if I do in Singapore, especially for political stories and so on, sometimes the risk could be quite high, and then you will just think whether it's worth it, and if it's not, maybe I'll can it. So this is a this is a video which I want to show everyone just to illustrate about the viral story thing. The audio is not on, but that's basically what the, the, the video is about. So I saw this video on a Facebook feed from a friend. This was this was back in I think twenty. 2015, 2015, I think. So this little girl, her head was stuck in the two win window, the this two grill, the bamboo pole. Her head was stuck, and then uh, it was on a fourth floor building, and nobody could get get up to rescue her until these two foreign workers from India they came they came by and they managed to scale the wall like Spider Man and they saved the baby, they saved the day. So when when my friend shared this video, I think he had like four comments or one or two likes on Facebook. That's it. It didn't go anywhere further because it wasn't widespread. But I saw an opportunity in a sense that this is a good story to tell and I asked for permission to have the video and I uploaded it on YouTube. And uh, it went crazy viral. This was the number one most viewed video on uh, YouTube in Singapore. Combined view is about 5 million. This was, this was in 2015. And it's not just that the video, the, the story itself that we wrote, it went so viral that I have inquiries coming in from uh, a lot of other publications from around the world. The 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 new sorry, the Huffing, Huffington Post, and then publications from India and so on. They were all asking me for information about this story. Why it went so viral is that it could be manufactured like I said. So when I have that piece, you know how you write the story is, it could have been very different. Like I could have written the story that this. This uh, this was this actually happened in a low cost housing area in Singapore. We have public flats, right? So this is a one two room flat, a low cost housing area. So I could have written it from a, from the angle that why is the low cost housing area they didn't have window grills, so that the boy can fall. You know that these people are probably not earning that well. They probably wouldn't spend extra money to install the window grills. Why didn't you put the grills there? But I figured that if I write something like that, it will probably be just a very anti establishment piece and uh, it's just going to generate a lot of hate and so on so it's not going to do any good to society. The other angle that I could have went was that uh, at that point of time I pay attention to news, I read a lot of news, uh, I'm a news junkie. At that point of time there was a news report about a polytechnic student in Singapore, I think he's about 18 or 19 years old. He has nothing better to do, he learned some martial arts so he decided to go down to Little India and he go and punch and kick uh, foreign workers for fun and he thinks that it's really cool and he was arrested and the sentiment was then was that why in the heck is, are people doing this? These are people who came here, you know, who built our houses and all this, they contribute to the economy and we have idiots like this as doing this. And there's that call for recognition for, for foreign workers that are here to build our homes and things like that. So I felt that that would be a better angle, so how I went with it was that there's these two guys, they, they, are, they are obviously not, they are not Singaporeans, but they have rescued a baby. In, in the other context, if it was a Singaporean who did that, you know, climb up the building like Spider-Man and rescue a baby, they probably would get a medal or a award for it. But nothing happened after that. So then I, I generated a story where you have a call to action, and I did a screen grab, the picture, and then I asked people to try and hunt for these two workers. And it worked, and then I went to sleep, and the next morning when I wake up, before that, I sent an email to all the news publishers and the editors and so on. Next morning, I was getting a lot of calls, and after that, there was a press conference. They managed to find a worker in just a few hours, and uh, the mix. even there was even a minister and so on. They, they start, you know, doing all the thing, you know, giving the award ceremony, and, and there was a lot of press coverage, and it was a home page, uh, front page of the Straits Times newspaper and everything. So. If you, if, if, you, if you think of a story this way, it can, be vir it can go viral. But having said that, for every 10 or 20 attempts that I do, I only get one of this. Huh? So, but that's good enough. It's just that, just like you know, any good startups is about creating a unicorn. So for a story, if you do it the same way, just keep repeating and iterating the same thing, you will have one or two of this. And every month, I just need one or two viral stories, and it will carry most of the traffic for the, most of the month. So that's, that's what it is. And... Uh, Ah, and, and then increasingly I find that if you run any good content site, the traffic split is now generally about half-half. Half coming from SEO traffic, which is those that people find, they, they, they come to your site from search. So you write 
content that are just for keywords. Another 50% will come from social media content, which is like the, the one that I just shared about the Indian workers. So social media content traffic, they will give you spikes. You know, it goes up and down, big spikes. Whereas the SEO content one, they give you an even reach, but they will go up. So every time they go up, it's like a layer cake, you know. The other one is spikes. So when you have your layer cake going higher and higher and the spikes going up, they, cumulatively, they can be a lot. So you, at, 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 although you know, social media content are very exciting, you shouldn't neglect the SEO part of it. They are, they are a little bit more boring and technical, but they actually help you to layer your traffic. Yeah, and I'll skip this. So this is another part which uh, works very well for me, scratching page views. Jenny, I think, I think most good news companies do that. So I actually learned this skill from uh, back when I was working at SBH, where we were running, they run the tabloid newspaper, the uh, one pound and singing, the two evening tabloid. So how do you scratch page views for a newspaper in order to sell more copy? Usually if they have an exclusive, like a story, they won't publish everything at one time and they know they, they are the only one with the source of information. They will lay out the information like in, let's say that's five days, that's five days a week, right? So they'll publish it Monday, Tuesday, Friday, every day a little bit, a little bit, so they can sell more copy. And I realized that it's the same for the online world. You will find that there's a one story that worked well, then you just keep writing uh, more of that same story and you link back to the previous one and then go back to the previous one and link back to the new one and you just keep cross-linking. All of them will, 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 will provide a, a spike in the page views for each of the article. So that has worked very well. Like for instance, the foreign worker story, uh, I churn a total of two, uh, that one I only did two articles, but there are other stories that I've done. Like recently, one of my writer was writing about uh, Kim Lim. Kim Lim is the daughter of the billionaire, uh, Peter Lim, and she got married with, uh, and she's pregnant, and she got married when she's pregnant, so it's juicy, you know, tabloid and everything. So then we did a, a few follow-up story about Kim Lim, and we just keep linking back, and it helps to push the traffic higher as well. So to recap, um, blogging for individual success, that's as an individual, is about visibility. It helps, helps you to get your name out there. And then there's also the personal branding aspect. And it helps you to network and to get business lead. And it complements other form of business venture which you may want to try. And for business or companies, again, it's about branding. Uh, you can own your own narrative. And you populate online literature with topics that you want to own networking and business leads as well, and it complement other forms of content marketing that you're doing. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. Uh, okay, guys, so that was a great talk. Thank you for telling us how you've explored e-commerce, plus also your viral video concepts, your business models. Uh, yes, so Alvin was here with us last year also, just a fun fact. Uh, so anybody has any questions to ask Elvin? Yes, a lady at the back, please. Yes. Um, can you hear me? I just wonder: is there is there an upper level of how often you should post? So is like daily too much, or what do you think? What, what, uh, you mean like the frequency of posts? It depends on whether it's an individual blog or it's a publisher model, right? So, and, and the type of content that you're doing. If it's a very niche content and you're confident that your audience is just there you know, for that one piece, you can do one or two pieces a month and they will still read it because they, they, it's that kind of content they want. But if you're operating like a publisher model like what we do, I would say three, four pieces is, is still okay because uh, like it's not just about People generally don't just come to your homepage to view content anymore. It could be distributed in your know, Facebook and other things and based on the time slot. I would say for Facebook, uh, generally everywhere in the world is always in the morning where, when people are going to work and then in the lunch when they are skiving and then just before they, they, hit, they, they go to sleep, they will probably browse again. So there's about three posts a day. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, anybody else has any questions? Okay. Yes, uh, hi. Yes. Yeah. So basically, now we're in an era where people are very concerned about fake news, right? So there's two aspects to this. So firstly, how do you convince your readers that the content you have on your website is legitimate? And secondly, right, like when pushing these kind of viral stories, how do you ensure that you're not like misleading people? Like oh, you okay. have your own like fact checking? 
Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So generally, we don't publish uh, things that we are not 100% sure that they are, they are, they are accurate. Uh. So, so like I mentioned, if even we are writing about, so, so other than those lifestyle content that we write, there are some, sometimes we write about some gossips and things like that. So if you're not very sure about the content, we won't publish it uh, because it's just invite too much negativity and other things. So we, so that there is that fact check thing. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you. All right. So. <laughs>